My finger got tired. Okay, we're now recording. Thank you. Here we go. Great. And you're going to bring up the slides? Do you want me to do the screen share as well? Oh, shoot. Never mind. Yeah. Here we go, guys. Yeah, what do I know? Do <laughs> Here we go. Okay, now we're on. Okay, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the first SAG. Sorry about the cheesy name, but it just kind of fell, fell together. We um, are going to, um, today is like the launch. So we're going to, we really talked a little bit about how we wanted to do this. And what we really want to do is do some time on orientation first, and then we want to start talking about uh, measures that bring value. Um, and um, I'll say this probably three or four times yeah. during this first presentation. This will only work if we're in it together and we learn from each other. So I'm looking forward to the dialogue. Um, we'll stop a couple places along the way for dialogue and hopefully have enough, a lot of time at the end for that. And then, um, and then uh, we'll also read the stuff in the chat, although I am really bad about reading while I'm talking. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and then um, this is for you all to get sustainability going in your communities. So we need to make sure what we're presenting is irrelevant. Um, so today, a little bit about orientation and intro, and then we're going to talk about measures selection to, and then we'll hopefully have a lot of time for discussion. Um, Rich, I'm going to turn the next few slides over to you. Yeah. So we're really uh, uh, excited of uh, this uh, uh, initial sustainability affinity group and I want to call out again our partners and our funder, the uh, folks from uh, HRSA, Maternal Science Health Bureau, Dr. Warren, uh, Ms. Padlin, uh, Dr. Mann, Ms. Brown, uh, and uh, Ms. McClellan. Uh, just to point out how wonderful it is, uh, uh, oftentimes projects are funded through particular uh, funding uh, project managers, um, and we got permission and uh, from Dr. Warren and support to actually do this project that crosses project officers and project teams. So we're really grateful both for the support as well as the, the flexibility uh, to, to be able to do this academy. Next slide. So I just want to remind people that, uh, how the Care Coordination Academy will relate to the, to the SAG and, and vice versa. So uh, the, the Care Coordination Academy, the uh, uh, multidisciplinary teams with families uh, as the core member of each of those teams, uh, are, uh, there's a lot of diversity in team structure um, in the, uh, the number of teams that we have. Uh, in the academy, we will be uh, uh, sequencing uh, uh, specific content topics, both that will address uh, priorities that you've shared with us, uh, both at the pre-launch surveys and then subsequent surveys. Uh, each, the goal of the academy is to move into implementation, into professional education, family engagement, implementation, and outcome measurement for care coordination. And the way that the, uh, uh, the SAG will relate to that is to really focus on, okay, so who are the key decision makers to get something implemented, get it measured, and um, to make sure that everybody uh, is contributing to the overall message. So we're very intentionally aligning the sequencing of the topics between the broader academy structure uh, with the uh, really how to approach that uh, Jeff Schiff is going to be uh, uh, bringing uh, into, uh, uh, into the SAG. Okay, next. So we will encourage you not to think about these two uh, entities, the, the Sustainability Affinity Group, i.e. the SAG and the Academy. So to the extent that you are developing your work plans, uh, selecting measures, testing measures for uh, uh, implementing measures and doing some rapid cycle uh, implementation exercises. We want you to be able to reflect on some of the uh, implementation uh, tactics and strategies that, uh, that Jeff uh, and others uh, in the Sustainability Affinity Group will be bringing that along. 
Uh, the National Center for Care Coordination Technical Assistance is available for technical assistance in between the sessions. She had you adapt that tool. Uh, are there other uh, state teams that we could talk to that have done that type of an assessment before? And then of course our work with the AAP at the National Resource Center for Patient Family Centered Medical Home. So we don't want academy participants to see these as two completely parallel processes. From your perspective, we would encourage you, in fact, to harmonize them and to bring them together. Next. Okay, back to you. Back to, back to me. So um, we sent you out the charter. Um, this is just to remind you that our purpose is um, to support teams that sustain, to do two, two things, to sustain care coordination services. And then I really want to think about the programmatic efforts to plan, implement, and evaluate the provision of these services um, as, a, um, as a separate sort of structural thing that needs to happen. Um, and so our goal here is to support both of those efforts. Um, Oop. Oh, why won't my, oop, here we go. Um, sorry guys. Um, so um, our goals are financial sustainability, accountability for health and well-being via tiered measurement. Um, that's what we're gonna talk about more today. Program evaluation of the financial impact, including for families, and I think, um, um, imperative in all of this is that we look at the impact of um, sustainability and what we're doing on different communities and really um, call out our div, um, our um, diversity and disparities. Um, I said this at the beginning, so now I'm going to say it again. A learning community, so I hope we have a chance to learn from each other along the way, and apologies for talking a lot in the beginning. Um, we are, I um, I'm a big fan of Project ECHO from New Mexico, and I'm not sure if any of you have been on ECHOs. They are covering the world now. Um, and um, um, Sandeep, who really started ECHOs in New Mexico to extend the outreach of, um, of um, treating hepatitis C into rural communities in New Mexico from Albuquerque has done sort of a phenomenal job. And um, these are some of the things that go into his echoes. And I really hope that they'll go into this too. I haven't applied for us to be an echo yet, but I think it's likely I will um, because I think it's really important to, for him to know the inspiration he caused, um, he's created. I will tell you that there are over three quarters of a million people who have participated like you in some sort of an echo. So his biggest thing is about democratizing knowledge, that there's nothing hidden here, that we're not trying to sell a special secret sauce and that everything's available to everybody. The next thing is about team-based care, which we spent some time on in the first, uh, the launch of the Care Coordination Academy sharing knowledge and best practices. I'm going to underline the best practices because getting knowledge into action is a tricky thing. And I think that we really have to acknowledge that just because you know something, getting it implemented um, is not always easy. And that's absolutely the case with this. So we ho hope that this um, um, care cord that this um, SAG helps you do that. We want to um, look at case-based learning, because I think that's what teaches us best. So we'll get to that in a minute. And then um, we haven't figured out how to do this exactly yet, but I think it's important for us to measure results. Are you having success in creating a sustainable program in your own communities? And you know, have we done anything to help you along those lines? Um, so the sessions really, we want to run in two ways. Um, we want to, and we're not, this is not an example of those sessions, but hopefully next one will be. The first part, we want to talk about a topic. Um, and the topic we're going to talk about today is, um, is measures to prove value, but we have other topics around, um, around getting data in real time, for example, is one of the other topics that could, and we'll try to get the best um, lecturers or people to talk about that. And we really welcome your input. If you know somebody who's an expert in one of these topics, please let us know. And then the second part we want to do is really case-based learning. We want to ask you all to present what's happening in your own teams 
understand where that's going and then ask your team to kind of um, ask the rest of the group to sort of respond to that team and give ideas about what's happened. There's a lot more expertise in this in this um, Zoom call than um, anybody could ever hope for. And I think that we can hopefully learn from each other. Um, so um, these are the topics that were on our pre-work um, launch survey that were the ones that we thought about doing first. And we could also talk about that if people want other things. There will have way more topics than this, but um, the first topic is around evidence-based outcomes of value across systems. And that's what we're going to try to talk about today some. The second is about support for real-time information at clinical sites. And I think there's, um, we'll talk about how to get that up there and, and give that to people. Um, I think uh, value-based purchasing strategies is, is another one, and there's a lot to talk about there. Care planning um, and complexity tiering um, was another one. And then return on investment justification. So sort of getting into the business side and the numbers as well. So lots, you know, if, if we just do those, that'll be enough, but we will have more, I'm sure. So to the case-based learning, I really want to ask, um, this is, we'll send this out as a handout, but we're going to ask uh, a team to volunteer where they're at next time, for next time to, to be the first uh, people to do that. We've actually had two calls with two of the teams already, um, and um, just to see where they're at and had those kind of case-based learning examples um, happen already, and we'd like to do that through this whole thing. I know it's a little weird talking to your colleagues at first, but I think most people are would really like to do that. Um, so here's what we think should be in the case-based learning. What's your goal from that we taught? And we talked about that at the Care Coordination Academy breakout. What sustainability challenge uh, is being addressed? Um, what activities have been done already? What measures have you considered? What are the immediate activities proposed? What's your timeline? Importantly, who are your allies and resistance and what are your next strategic steps? Remember, we're building this a step at a time. So it's not, so we wanna know where you're, what you're gonna to go to next. And I think if we can do this, we'll really learn from each other a lot along the way. So I'm gonna stop for a moment. Um, Heather, are the microphones automatically open here? And we do have them automatically open, so everyone should be able to unmute and mute themselves. Great. So any questions about the format and how this will run first? You can also pop right. questions into the chat now, too, if you'd like, and I'm happy to share them. Okay. All righty. So we're going to try this. We're going to try right now, and you know, the next SAG will be what we start with but we wanted to go through that orientation. So here, let's talk about selecting measures to prove value. And um, I'm gonna, I am going to um, turn this over to Rich for a few minutes. So you might remember this slide from the second uh, launch day of the Academy is the sort of notion of selecting measures that matter. Uh, we're gonna talk a, a little bit uh, in more de depth today and subsequent um, uh, sessions about when you select a measure, uh, where do you want the, uh, it to be deployed? Um, some of the measures of care coordination, depending on where the delivery system is uh, at in its journey, uh, the initial a locus for implementation might actually be in individual clinics, and that's really okay. Um, the uh, ability to extend to, say, a delivery system, to a, a region, to a state, to a particular payer, Medicaid program, commercial payer, uh, uh, and, and managed care organization, uh, an MCE is their uh, the acronym goes in uh, in Indiana, but we want you to think about the uh, what the level of implementation of that measure would be, and then thinking about this fitness for purpose um, is the measure correctly specified for what you're trying to do. So to evaluate the care of an individual child and simultaneously aggregating those scores up to the level of a program, an institution or a state, does that make sense? 
And the answer, the short answer to that question is they don't always make sense. And, and I find that fit for purpose is the, is the comment that I make most commonly um, in various national and state level programs. So we want you to develop a sensibility around ultimately what do we want to demonstrate for an outcome and how will we get there. Uh, Jeff and I are trying really hard to promote this notion of a uh, learning health system. So to reduce the burden of collecting data for the sake of collecting the data and demonstrating uh, that you've checked boxes, but being able to react to those data points that actually leads to improvement. So this is one of those arguments actually to start small, start at the level of a clinic and are, uh, are those measures appropriately usable and feasible. Uh, and as you start to uh, get uh, usability, feasibility data, and can feed back into the system to drive improvement, that's how you can start to make the argument for higher level performance measures. And with care coordination and care integration, uh, this is the journey that um, we feel is going to be important, both in the academy, uh, as well as with demonstration of implementation and accountability in the uh, affinity group. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just jump down to the last one. Um, this is a, this approach, bottom up, is especially important because if you look carefully at um, the some of the core measures that we shared last time and that uh, Jeff will be reprising again this time, there aren't that many measures that would be relevant to children with medical and social complexity CMC and for children and youth with special health care needs uh, uh, in general. Uh, so that means that we have to be creative when we're thinking about these cohorts of particularly vulnerable and or at risk kids. So fitness for purpose, implementation, usability, feasibility, driving change uh, at the unit that is most empowered for that intervention. Next slide. My, my computer is beeping at me, so give me one second mm -hmm. there. Try again. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Alrighty, I think this is mine. Everybody see this okay? Um, so I just want to... Heather? You want me to switch? <laughs> yeah, I want to switch because I'm just not right. sure. I'm going to stop sharing and let Heather run the slides because I'm having a little trouble here. All right. Can everybody see my screen now? Yep. All right. Just let me know when you want me to switch. Let me pull this up big. Okay. I think we got to go back for a sec. I think I moved too far too fast. Would you like me to be here? Okay, so here we go. Perfect. Yep. Um, so I really want to um, um, talk. This is really what we want to talk about today. And I want to. What I want to do is talk. Is leave this here as something. Well, we make. I mean, we'll talk about this, and we may come back to it. But I really think that um, what we really heard, I think, from the teams we've already talked to, and from your pre-work, is that you know you have a you know, everybody here is doing incredible work and everybody really needs to talk about how to build a measurement case for policymakers. Because I think policymakers are the folks, you know, they're the people who are going to decide whether you get paid or not and how much you get paid and how the system gets implemented. And they sometimes have very different perspectives. So they want to spend some time um, getting to this. So, and I think I just want to say that what, a, what really jazzes up a policymaker and gets them to requote you at the, at the um, legislative hearing table is some real world change that they hear about. Um, and so 
Um, we're going to talk about structure, process, and outcome measures and spend some time on that. Um, and we're going to go back to building a talk a little bit about what Rich was talking about as far as building a tiered measurement system that works. But in the end, we really have to make sure we uh, um, we get to what the policymakers need here. So next page. Can you get to the next one, Heather? There we go. Oop, there we go. So I want to talk first. I want to take measurement out. Well, I think there's one in between. Is there? Or am I missing? Sorry. Let's see. Nope. Okay. Go ahead. The next one. So I really want to talk about. Um, um, you know, in about five or six years ago, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, came out with a report called the Vital Signs Report. And the first sentence of the report basically said the measurement structure for American healthcare is broken. Um, and I think that they really express a lot of frustration, which I, we could talk a lot about, about how many measures docs have um, or other providers. The number that stuck out from one of these reports was that it costs $45,000 per provider per year to do measurements. And we're not, how much are we getting enough out of it? So the next three slides, including this one, are about ways um, different groups have talked about um, um, about how to um, what should be measured and what what should we think of uh, systems as accountable for. So the IOM really took this three this four pronged approach, which which is healthy people, care quality, care cost, and engaged people, and in some ways. Um, I look at healthy people as sort of the population-based measures and care quality, care cost, and engaged people as the triple aim from the um, um, uh, from Don Berwick and his group. So that's one frame. Next, next slide. Next slide, I'm now making um, shamelessly advertising for something we did at Minnesota DHS. And this is, and our agency was not just Medicaid, but was really big. And we talked about um, well, what well-being would look like um, for the people served by the Minnesota Department of Human Services, which includes like child protection and food stamps, et cetera. But we really came up with health, which are all the measures that kind of IOM, we just talked about with IOM. We talked about safety, like do people have a place to live and our kids in child welfare in the right place. But then the next two, I think, are really important, um, and they're about purpose and connectedness. Do adults have meaningful work? Do kids have meaningful school? And are people connected to each other? And I think that, I think I'm excited about this because I think that when you're in healthcare for a long time and realize you can only affect people's well-being so much, the idea of adding purpose and connectedness is really important. And so that's what we've been talking about for, we were talking about for a few years in Minnesota. And then next slide. Um, along comes this month a report from um, the Center for Healthcare Strategies and RWJ, which is called a Framework for Thriving, a Comprehensive Approach to Child Health. And I was really glad that they copied us. I don't think they copied us, but I'm, but I think it was cool because they looked at optimal physical emotional health. They have four things: safe, stable, and nurturing relationships with healthy adults safe communities to meet environmental needs, and education beginning at birth that promotes multidimensional skill building, building. So if we could get to a measurement and well-being care system that addressed all these things, I think we'd all be happy to, um, to, be, uh, to go celebrate. And we're hoping that um, some of our measures will, get, will move us along in this direction. So next slide. Um, so I start. I talked a little bit about um, accountability to policymakers, and Rich talked about accountability um, to each other for quality improvement um, in a tiered measurement system. But I think of this these as tiers. The first being accountability to each other for quality improvement. The next being accountability to the state, to like Medicaid programs and MCOs, and that'll we'll talk about this. But a lot of that is process of care. Next to policymakers, and I think about that as um, as more as like legislators or the governor's office for better care and understanding of cost. And then obviously I think in the end, the way to make this come full circle is to be accountable 
um, to each other to make to make a real difference. Next slide. So the first set of policymakers are what I are really I think of the people in the Medicaid program and the MCOs. And I think that the and we can talk about this after we're done, that a lot of folks there think about the core set, which we'll go into some more detail about. Think about um, the home health, um, the health home set of measures that are required by CMS, and then think about utilization. Next slide. I think the approach to policymakers who are legislators and the governor's office is really kind of different. It's a less concrete, but still is kind of based in the same thing. So I know that legislators and people who are not well versed in in healthcare measurement don't respond well to the word HEDIS or to the word CAPS or those kind of things that a lot of us have lived with for a long time. Their eyes will glaze over pretty quickly and we have to be careful about how we communicate results to them. Um, people always respond to stories and I really will talk, I think we should talk about that in a separate sag, but I think it's a, it's a really important thing to figure out how to communicate stories and who to communicate, who should communicate them and it's, the bottom line is it's not us providers. Um, we should talk about what outcomes they really want to look at. And even if you don't have that outcome quite yet, um, we really want to make sure that we're giving them measures that point to an outcome that they can understand. And I would argue that at, the, at this level, um, less is more sometimes um, because we want to get these folks engaged in the problems we're trying to solve. Um, next is about family satisfaction, and I think that legislators, especially if you've got a mom in your district who you know, um, are really interested in family satisfaction with their health care system. And last and certainly not least, because everybody's, every state's going to, is going to be in a budget hole here, is about utilization and whether we can argue for the appropriate utilization. Um, next. Um, so I want to do something fun in the middle of this because uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, structure, process, and outcome measures. So um, um, Abedis Donabedian is the guy who started and is responsible, I think a lot of people think, for a lot of healthcare quality improvement. And he talks about structure, process, and outcome measures. So since I've moved to Utah, but in my past life, I I did something which you'll now see, and I wanted you to think about each of these things as structure, process, and outcome measures. So, Heather, next slide. This is a floating loon platform sitting in my garage. You can see um, some beautiful things about it. It's got netting on the bottom. It's got a mesh roof so the eagles don't take the loon eggs, and this is a structure that you need in order to get to the uh, the next part, which is, go ahead, which is my process measure of having a nesting loon on the platform, on the water, um, um, hopefully um, um, incubating eggs. And then of course, my uh, the outcome measure, you're gonna know this, what's coming, right? Here's the outcome measure, successful um, hatching of chicks that are um, out floating around. So I miss these guys being in Utah, but actually I have a sustainability story that the person who bought my home up there um, has now taken over the effort. So there will be more um, loons in Northern Washington County. But I think you get the picture illustrated in this way about um, structure, process, and outcome measures. And now if we'll go to the next slide, that's all the fun you get. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what structure, process, and outcomes measure, measures we have now. And so next slide. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Rich because I think that what Rich is going to talk about are some of the measures we talked about in the um, in the first uh, launch. And I think the real message here, in some regard, is that one person's structure measure, maybe another person's process or outcome measure, but we have to think about it in terms of who we're presenting it to. So for a legislator, an outcome measure is less maternal mortality or less maternal morbidity, where for us, an outcome measure may be 
the completion of a hypertension protocol for a mom who's got really high, high blood pressure. So Rich, why don't you talk about this for a little bit and how it fits, and then we'll keep on going and looking at structure, process, and outcome. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And uh, I, I love the, the uh, avian explanation of uh, Donna Bedian. Um, so let's come to talk a little bit about types of measures. So thinking about that tiering, some measures at the level of a clinic delivery system up to a state level. And, and we've got to figure out what it is that we're trying to accomplish here. Now, I know that several of the teams uh, are grantees from uh, the uh, Center for Medicaid, uh, um, the CMMI, the Innovation Center. Um, and actually, um, uh, alternative payment model formulation is one of the goals there. So let's talk a little bit about this. For, uh, in this space, we talked uh, at the Academy launch about the so-called FESAT, uh, which is a, a self-assessment uh, that looks at how well families are engaged in a particular uh, initiative. It could be a narrowly defined project, it could be a broad initiative, but this is a very powerful tool that, that really sort of assesses the process of meaningful family engagement. The, the uh, family experience of uh, coordinated care is uh, the so-called FECC is actually an endorsed measure from the National Quality Forum. It focuses on um, there's some structural measures in there. Do you have a care coordinator? Uh, there are some process measures around uh, access to uh, uh, planning resources uh, and the like. And then there's the care coordination measurement tool that I know many of you are already using, um, which Join really, the looks, meeting. really looks at uh, what are the activities that you're doing uh, that are traditionally non-billable uh, uh, to support care coordination. We call that a value stream capture. None of these are outcome measures. All of them to one extent or another are extremely important to document your progress to get to your goals. So Jeff correctly pointed out the likelihood that any of those measures would get the attention of say a Medicaid leadership program as a standalone measure are pretty low. However, uh, we're going to argue that to get to your strategically prioritized goal, say it's care integration for patients with autism or whatever each of your uh, teams is focusing on, you have to pay attention, especially to the process measures. Um, outcome measure relevant to children with special health care needs and children with medical complexity. Uh, as fate would have it, uh, since the last launch day, uh, day two, a few weeks ago, and today, um, uh, CMS had reached out to me to make some comments about what I thought the current state of quality measures would be for kids with special health care needs, and in particular, children with medical and social complexity. And, and my answer quite succinctly was uh, the current slate, a lot of those HEDIS measures are, are necessary, but they're far from sufficient for this population. And so we're using increasingly experience measures, not simply satisfaction, but experience measures of integration. So we're trying to find and promote measures that are broadly relevant across the population of CMC and CYSHCN that um, could in fact, get the attention of Medicaid programs, MCE or MCO uh, uh, entities as well, and family advocacy groups. So this is a, 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 an analysis that Jeff and I wanted to share with you so you could be thinking about how to select measures. Next. Great. So. Um, I want to, just because I think it's important for this group to understand, I thought we should spend just one slide talking about the measurement system um, nationally. And um, I guess I will tell you that I have, um, in full disclosure, I've been part of a lot of different parts of this process. Um, and sometimes I could say I'm 
I don't think it's done. And I'll just say, I, I think it could do more to move things along, which is why this academy is really exciting for us because we think, okay, you know, all these measures don't really mean anything unless we get to the outcome. So I just want to say that things like measure development. So there's a whole group of folks and they were, have been funded by ARC and there have been some really good measures that have come out of measure development. For I'll give you an example. There's a great, there's some great measurements around sickle cell disease and around whether kids are getting antibiotics in, the, in their early childhood to prevent them from getting having, seps, having sepsis. There's measures um, people think, okay, well, we need a measure about whether kids who are on antipsychotic medications are getting, getting checked for metabolic syndrome. A lot of people know these things, but then the measure goes off and somebody starts looking at their data and produces a measure uh, based on this from a lot of times or most often nowadays for what we do from the codes that are in the claim system. So you have to think, are there codes there that can make that happen? Next thing that happens then is the measure gets validated against a separate set of, um, of um, charts or a separate set of claims to see if it produces the same measure in a different place. And a lot of time that requires going back and doing uh, a chart review to see if the, the stuff is actually often there. Rarely does it actually go back to the patients themselves. The next step um, is one that I think people don't always know about, but that's where these measures, if you want to get a measure into some of the national sets, you have to get the measure endorsed. Um, measure endorsement goes through National Quality Forum. Um, the National Quality Forum um, has a big contract with the federal government to look at measures and see whether or not there are the things Rich talked about. Are there, is it valid? Is it feasible? Um, is it important? And those sort of things. And there is a whole set of endorsement committees that, that do that. There's actually some interesting talk now, and I, this is probably blasphemy for some people, about the fact whether or not this endorsement process takes too long or is too usable. The holy grail then is the next one, which is getting your measure into the Medicaid set. If you're a measure developer, if you've been working on a measure and you get it into the Medicaid set, you feel like you're golden. Um, we, um, I just, in full disclosure, I got to measure endorsement, but I never got to the measurement set on, a, on an opiate measure. But I think if it's in the measurements, the measurement set, that's, um, that's the core set. And I think a lot of you probably know those. We'll go over them again here in a minute. But that means that a lot of people are going to pay attention to those measures. And um, may, people, what's really we talk about a lot is that the real estate on the on the Medicaid core set is really valuable. You know, nobody wants to get to 2,000 measures there. People want to get keep it at this 25 to 30 for the adults and 25 to 30 for the kids. And to get to a really big set of measures is really kind of a um, too much of a problem. Even at 25 to 30, I have to say this, a Medicaid program can only focus on improving one or two measures because of the amount of work that goes into the improvement process. Once something's in the core set, it's um, people use incentives, oftentimes in managed care contracts or other, um, or other incentives to try to get, to get up their Medicaid measures. Um, they can um, give MCOs a withhold where they'll pay them less if they don't get a measure up. But I think a lot of times, you know, that's the most common way. There's lots of other ways that could happen. And then the measures are reviewed every year in a very formal process for inclusion or removal. So there was a measure for a while in there about whether we were treating um, pharyngitis appropriately, which is really a measure of whether kids got a strep test before they got antibiotics. And that was a huge amount of work that rolled up from individual patient care that a lot of you can relate to all the way up to a state level. And I think after a while we realized this was not a great measure because if you don't want to, if you wanted to give somebody antibiotics, you could just code something else and not worry about the pharyngitis and the strep test. So I think that became a case where the measure didn't work and it was, had it been taken off um, the set other measures get included, and there's big battles about how relevant they are and how big a population they are. Nobody's been, the battles have all been verbal so far, so it's hopefully I stay that way. <laughs> but anyway, let's keep going. Um, next slide. 
So what we know most and what we measure most are these three things. Under the, under the uh, structure, process, and outcome, we measure more on process, and on process, we measure more on access, quality, and satisfaction. So in some ways, um, this is where a lot of the measures go, and you can go to the next slide. So I wanted to just go through the set. This I put up really briefly on the, at the opening of the uh, academy, but I wanted to talk about these. So I wanted people to think of these. These are all measures in the core set. And I'll just say real briefly to remind you all that the reason I wrote the road to 2024 is that the child core set, reporting on the child core set by states will be required um, in 2024. So not only is are the measure what's in the measure set really important. Christine but McCoy joined the meeting. But Hello. Um, but states are really interested in um, making sure they do well compared to their peer states. So in terms of um, the core set, when you think about structure, process, and outcome, and you think about whether these are around access around or around quality or around satisfaction, you can see that the primary care and preventive service measures are mostly around access to care. Did, um, did kids get their immunizations? Did they get their well child visits? Did they get screened for developmental um, 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 problems? You know, and, um, um, and so if you think about that, this is really about access. And I sometimes think that the access measures are things that we in this academy can make a big difference with because we can make sure that our kids get immunizations if they have um, medical complexity because they still need their immunizations. We can make sure that they get their well visits and they get screened for autism or for developmental delay or for, or for high risk um, adolescent behaviors. All those things can happen um, and we can prove that we're doing those things because those are things that Medicaid officials can then take back to their colleagues in Medicaid and say, well, we're, these people who are working on, on taking care of these complex kids have not forgotten and are doing these important things. And that's important because you can't, you're much less likely to get meningitis if you've had a vaccine for meningitis. But it's not, I want to remind people, it's not the outcome we're hoping for at the very end, but it's what we have now. And it's, I guess I'd say it's pretty good. I think the next ones on chronic, on acute and chronic conditions are really hard for the core set. And they're hard for the core set because there are so many chronic conditions that are important. You know, opiate use disorders, the, chronic, the core set for adults is the core set measure, set of measures that people are really working to get measures on right now. For kids, there are measures around, and you'll see them in the next slide too, around asthma, around attention deficit. This is where the real estate gets really competitive. And my friend, um, um, Gary Freed from, uh, from Michigan, really has great measures of, for sickle cell disease. The problem is it's too rare a disease to make to have room on the core set for it still still should be measured but like here we're looking at measures of quality of what the providers do which are measures of um, the asthma medication ratio is really about whether or not patients have filled asthma prescriptions commensurate with their level of severity of their asthma and emergency department visits are to be present prevented if possible but we but you can look at the rate that certain provider groups or certain health plans have of emergency department use to see if they're managing chronic diseases so people don't have to go to the emergency department. And being a pediatric ER doc, we could spend a lot of time on that, but I think that's enough on that topic. Next, for the second, this is just the second of three slides. If you could go ahead, Heather, um, on um, the Medicaid course set. These are the behavioral health ones, um, follow up. Um, for attention deficit, um, metabolic monitoring for um, adolescents who are on antipsychotics um, because there are metabolic complications of being on those on those um, medications, um, and then first line psychosocial care. So these are all things that that have that are on the course that taking up course that real estate that your teams could address, and they could then you could then go to Medicaid and talk to them about. The, the value you're providing in addressing these. 
I want to be clear, these are not the only things you're doing by any means, but these are things that could be that you could use to translate your work into the Medicaid core set. Um, the next ones are on dental, which is another big topic, um, and they are the two that are on their dental sealants and um, people who've had a preventive dental service visit. And then the last one, so all of these I think of as sort of quality or access measures, and then the last slide is really on experience of care, um, and this is CAPS, and CAPS gets asked um, uh, and with uh, and gets asked about chronic they, with a chronic condition supplement. So this is sort of about, um, I guess, at a macro level, whether or not um, the care that's being provided by you all or by the health plans is meeting the needs of the family. I would argue that the measures that Rich was talking about. Um, um, we're, are a much more intimate look at this and that this is going to be done by a health plan or by a surveyor. But if you want to improve this, you would really want to get to improve and talk about addressing CSAT and uh, family involvement. Um, next slide. I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about health home. And there are some, I'm sure there are experts in, on health home here. Health Home was part of the Affordable Care Act and is a payment mechanism that was, um, um, was used by a lot of Medicaid states and still being used by a lot of Medicaid states for, um, um, for providing care coordination. Health Home provided two years of a 90% match. So it made it much cheaper for states to, to provide these services. Health home um, was for people who had two or more chronic conditions, one chronic condition and at risk for a second, which I think then includes all the three people in America, you know. Um, and then, um, and then it really had some focus on um, serious um, mental health conditions. Um, interestingly, the way health home rules were written is it couldn't exclude people by age, it could exclude them by diagnosis. So you wouldn't have a big congestive heart failure population, hopefully in pediatrics, but like you could have a whole health home around um, attention deficit. Join the meeting. So, so states have used this as a tool for, um, um, for getting them to start doing care coordination. Um, um, Health home services can be targeted geographically, which is not classically the case for um, a state. Most of the time, a state plan has to include, have a state Medicaid services that's statewide. And um, Medicaid and Medicare duals cannot be excluded from health home services. And then these are the health home services that have to be provided or offered. And you'll recognize these as things you all do well, I hope. Um, comprehensive care management, care coordination, health promotion. So, you know, doing a health um, a wellness survey and making sure those things are addressed. Comprehensive transition care. And for us in pediatrics, that means something a little different than it means for people who are leaving the hospital and going to skilled nursing facilities. Patient and family support. I'll read that one more time for emphasis, patient and family support. So I think that's really a great opportunity and referral to community and social service supports. Um, so it's really about an integrated system. And I think this is really still moving along and states are still using it. And the whole idea is really to prove value in the first two years where it's paid for and move it along. The reason, the other reason I wanted to put this up here is that there's this piece of legislation that passed, I think this past year called ACE Kids. That's not adverse childhood events. That's um, what does ACE stand for in that regard? It's really, I think of it as, in a way, as health home for um, for kids, with an emphasis on improving care for our, this population. That program is not launched yet. It'll be another couple of years before it gets launched. But a lot, it has a lot of the same resonance um, as the health home program. And then next slide, health home has. Um, we just move to the next slide. Health Home has a whole bunch of quality measures. I won't, these are almost all for adults, um, but they are things like follow up after hospitalization for mental illness, 
adult body mass index, so checking for um, metabolic syndrome, um, things like utilization measures like inpatient utilization and ambulatory um, um, and emergency department visits. So these, this is another example of a program that CMS has put in place that has put in place a bunch of measures that in the structure process outcome world are probably more focused on process and in the process world are more focused on access and quality and probably a little less on satisfaction. But that's how Medicaid thinks about these things. So I just wanted to bring that up. So if you go to the next slide, I'm pretty much getting done here with this. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, Jeff, um, just a quick question. Um, is health home part of the ACE legislation? Um, ACE is uh, separate, but I think if I rem I've only read it once, so I have to be honest about that. I think ACE builds off of the health home um, legislation and is part of that. And Mary's, I see Mary's on my screen, and um, and that is, um, um, and so it builds off of that. But it requires, for example, a different set of measures that will be put forward. So we actually have an opportunity to impact those measures rather significantly as a as a um, academy, and I think that it'll, that uh, folks will listen to a group like this. So, we, so in some ways, we want to influence the measures because we know this stuff better than other people, and then we want the measures that we have an influence on getting accepted to then be the measures we get measured against. So, I think we have to think of ourselves Join the as, meeting. Many, as many places in this loop. Okay, um, Heather, I mean, Heather, any other um, quick, quick questions? Yep, uh, right Nick from Philadelphia is just asking, what does exceptional mean in this context? Um, is that the, does anybody know the acronym for ACE? I'm sorry, I don't know it offhand. Uh, advancing Care for Exceptional Kids, we got a response from Mary, thank you. And I sent yeah, a link I out. Don't Jeff, if people want to do some reading, the Children's Hospital Association actually has a nice uh, summary of it. So in the chat, everybody, there's a link to the CHA description of ACE kids. And does anybody know, because I'm just going to ask this question, I didn't remember, I don't remember a definition of, um, of exceptional in the legislation. Does anybody know if it, there's a specific definition in there? We will spend, a, I think we need to go to this piece of legislation at some point and spend some time with it um, down, down the line here. Uh, Jeff, um, okay, I, next. Jeff, hold on for a second. I want to emphasize a point that you just raised. Um, I do believe that the outreach that I had a couple weeks ago from somebody uh, from CMS asking about measures that are relevant for kids with complex needs. So Nick, this is partially uh, in response to uh, yeah, your question, Nick, Nick uh, Claxton, uh, exceptional would be the types of kids we're calling so-called children with medical complexity. It's about one and a half percent of the pediatric population. One of the potential uh, benefits for these children and families is the ability to cross state lines to get care in pediatric referral centers. Um, and so we, we are talking about a level of complexity here where you know sometimes these children uh, don't have access to high level subspecialty services in their own state. So an important uh, provision of ACE kids is just that. So yeah, essentially we're talking about kids with medical complexity. Yeah, and a few other people have clarified that, so thank you. Okay, so I want to get done talking. We've been yakking at you for an hour. I apologize. Um, but I wanted to just have two more slides just to get this discussion going, and hopefully we'll have a, a, a nice discussion. If you're shy, you can chat it in, and if you're not, hopefully you'll speak up. Um, so I, we wanted to ask these three questions. How is measurement linked to your sustainability goal? Um, what are you measuring now to prove value? How, where have you presented your value case? And then last slide is really more for us. Um, what do you need next for this topic? So you can just put that in there as well. But I wanna just go back, go back to the previous slide if you don't mind Heather, thank you very much. And then uh, 
ask where people are at with their states. And if you, when you talk, if you would just tell us where you're from and if you want and your name and so we know where to go, okay? I know people are shy. I don't think ever, anyone's ever accused me of being shy, so I'll be willing to speak. Thanks, Mary. And I'll second that. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I'll second it. Can you go back to the last slide, yeah, though? Um, Thanks. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, hi, everyone. I'm from Indiana State, a state in uh, the and we're part, we're one of the 10 teams in the um, COIN for children with medical complexity. And we're um, working on um, uh, sustainability in from our state Medicaid. And due to the some of the changes that have happened around COVID, we're not putting in a health home application as we had hoped to for our sustainability. So now we've had to do an about face and go back to our managed care organizations and ask them, What's our value added? What are your pain points that we can help you with? Um, and so we're measuring, one of the things we're working on measuring is that we can reach families and clinicians and get them to do things. And the managed care organizations have trouble reaching those people. They don't pick up the phone. And so while it's a fairly low bar um, as a primary care care coordination project to, for patients to answer us when we call them, um, it is actually quite important to the managed care organizations. And then again, for our ability to walk into the primary care doctor's office and say, can you make sure this kid gets his flu shot um, uh, is easier for us than them as well. So those were entities that they asked us to look at and now we have to go back to them and talk about, so how much is that worth to you? Because everybody in our state is being told that their budgets are going to be cut 15% next year. So um, that's a secondary uh, COVID problem. Um, we've, we've developed just a working group with the medical directors of both our state agency and our managed care organizations. And those are kind of the people who are our portals of entry to the conversations. I think I answered the question. So Mary, Mary, when you ask, when they, when you present this to them and talk about what you're doing, um, do they, do you also ask about, do you also tell them the amount of effort and whether, and what you're, what you need as far as resources to make that happen? Yeah, so we have a, we have a cost estimate of what it costs us to do what we need in a per member per month manner. Um, and that's around $115. Um, uh, and um, we use a um, model in which one care coordinator provides service to 100 children with medical complexity, which is a high number, but it's the only way we could get that per member per month in a range that they would even consider paying. Um, and uh, um, we also talk about our activities. We are using the care coordination measurement tool and measuring um, uh, volume of contacts and um, uh, amount of time the different work takes like creating shared plans of care and prioritizing goals with families. Thanks. Does anybody else want to talk about what they've um, what they have um, spoken with their managed care or Medicaid programs about as, as far as what they have they have looked at as a as a uh, as a value to them yeah uh, i'm curious is, oh, go ahead yeah, hi Rick. Uh, go ahead rahel rahel uh Brahane, texas children's comprehensive care clinic um we are um in a state with a health and human services medicaid program that is requiring their managed care organizations to progressively contract in an alternative payment model, a certain percentage of the claims payment every year. So there is clearly an incentive, both by the MCO and HHSC, to work with us on some sort of different alternative payment system. Uh, we have been, um, the first level of engagement we had was to take on some of the care coordination, service coordination function that was in the MCO space 
and hire our, our nurses and have them be uh, placed in the clinic and uh, do the service coordination function that they are required to do. And this had proved to be maybe less useful than we thought because there was a whole lot of processes that don't necessarily add value, but these are ways by which the MCO had contracted with, health, with Medicaid. And because we have now taken the delegation, we have to sort of make sure that they meet their contractual obligations. Where we're struggling with measurement right now is, we feel that clinics, health homes that specifically are organized towards the needs of children with medical complexity, the 0.5 to 1% of very complex children, the clinic organized around that, uh, it has to show some more value than any random clinic that sees everybody and, uh, and just sort of has a few patients that are complex. Now, how do we show that? How do we show that this is valuable? What are these clinics all about? They're all about care coordination. I mean, it is, and in our case, we are saying a complete transformation of the service delivery paradigm by having integrated virtual visits where the home health, the key subspecialists, the parents, the DME guys all actually meet twice a year and make a plan. And the PCP becomes the central person that makes sure that plan actually exists in writing and everybody's medications are reconciled and the parent actually has wrapped around what the plan is. There is now, there needs to be a way to measure this work. Um, and this is what we are hoping to do during this process is to identify measures that will show the effectiveness of this care coordination or this care integration um, to Medicaid. And just from what I've heard so far, you know, this is very uh, um, good for us to see sort of how this, how the sausage is made. And um, however, none of the measures that we have really help differentiate us from an FQHC that sees all comers. So how do we, what are the measures? It's not the HEDIS measures. It's not whether we've had any immunizations. It's not wellness visits. There's gotta be other things that we measure. Uh, so that's, that's what we're hoping to learn from this. Yeah. So I think you bring up this really important point about um, that gets into um, identifying who gets in your clinic um, and then whether you can, in some ways, if you're treating that 1% and that's where the focus is, which is a whole other topic about whether you clinics want to do just that group, but just focusing on that group, you know, I, I am sure that somebody in Medicaid or in the managed care organization knows the cost structure for those folks. Um, and, you know, we didn't talk a lot about utilization metrics, but we talked a little bit about them. And so I think you get into this question of, I mean, you get into this question of how, who are those folks? How much do they cost? How much do you, does your care coordination impact that cost? And can you prove the value of that? And I guess what I would say is at the end of the day in situations like that, because the numbers can be really small, there has to be some trust, you know, that you're doing things that are more important and that you are doing good, um, you're doing really good care coordination and that the time is well spent. Um, but um, so I think that that, um, I'm taking notes because I think that'll be really worthwhile to talk about how we um, um, how we look at those kids with medical complexity and you know prove value. And I'm curious if anybody there's a few I know there's a few folks on here from their Medicaid programs. If anybody else wants to talk to this point or um, from the other how the Medicaid programs think about that. Um, yeah, this is Drew Nelson. I'm with Alabama Medicaid Agency, and we actually create a task force um, as we were developing our massive care coordination program. Um, and we looked at, we had 
all the children's hospitals, we had uh, sister agencies and several different uh, providers work with us. And we, we really struggle in trying to identify outcome measures. Um, we used some surveying uh, data. We actually compared the experience of care questions from the CAP survey, and we also subsampled for populations we identified as children with medical complexity. But one of the things we also have looked at are utilization measures, knowing that, yes, CMC children tend to utilize services more, um, but we wanted to see if there was any outliers or how big of a difference there was in the general population versus the CMC population. So kind of setting a base on it, kind of watch that as we progress and as we provide new additional care coordination for those CMC children. Great. So Drew, can I just ask, when you did that, you know, there wasn't a value-based payment in any way linked to utilization. It was really about understanding utilization. Correct. And we implemented a PCPME model, so it's without a value-based purchasing. It's it's just a care coordination model, not full managed care. Right. Yeah, I think that you make this really important point that I'm curious if others can speak to too, which is, you know, you need a part. You know, what you're really talking about is having a partnership between the providers and the state to understand these this population really well. Um, and Drew, are you at the state itself, or are you at a managed care organization? Yeah, I am. Um, I'm director of networks and coordination support of the Medicaid agency. So I actually help pick some of the measures for the program. I'm with the agency, and our health plans are um, are provider based, so it's not a traditional um, managed care health plan. Great. Cool. Got it. So can I put you on the spot for a minute and tell me and and have you say if you've thought about this at all, what's the um, what's an outcome measure you'd like to see for the for this population that you'd say, oh man, we're doing well. In all the work we've looked at, utilization is one that you really can't change. And, and going back to your the comparison of child core, I mean, back uh, I think Mary made the point earlier. The vaccinations and utilization of care that is tends not to be the same in the CMC population because they are utilizing the services. Them not getting the annual well checkups is such a outlier. Um, them not having the vaccination is an outlier. What we were actually looking at is more on somewhat on the CAP survey, the experience of care that the parents and the family actually feel um, a part of the care coordination plan, that they actually feel that they are receiving the resources necessary, that they are being communicated by the providers, that they have someone that they can reach out to, a care coordinator who works with them. But we, we really have struggled for outcome measures um, to really identify because now, we looked at even linkages to education, to linkages to long-term goals, but it's, for Medicaid agents, it's really hard to look at three, five, ten-year goals when you're looking at year-to-year -year budget. Right. I think that's a really important point to understand, too, about the, uh, about Medicaid is that it is really hard to, uh, um, you know, Medic Medicaid is responsible for usually a biennial budget and then maybe the biennium after that. So it's really hard to get to a bigger group. Bigger group. Um, I have a question, if, if possible, along the, the same lines. You know, we find utilization. Uh, is that okay or you want to move on to, to the next? No, that's fine. I think if people can, Heather, I hope you're, I think you are, Oh, we got it. If people want to talk, will you just raise your hand or I'm you really bad about monitoring yeah. Zoom as we're going here. So I'd love to, but go ahead, uh, and then we'll see, we'll okay. keep going. Um, okay, I have to see how to raise my hands here. But the, just a quick question here. One of the things I find um, are, there's universal agreement around is the more successful you are in making sure that the multidisciplinary care is integrated, it is actually delivered at the same time, 
with all of the parties discussing, you know, what is the seizure plan and what's the respiratory plan and what do we have for care and support and what the home health nurses are supposed to do, you're more likely to get to, um, to break the silos and get to a, a completely different delivery paradigm. It, why is it not possible to have measures that actually incentivize integration? Jeff, can I do that? You bet. That would be great. So um, there's a couple of, of really important takeaways here. So one, integration is absolutely essential. And I'm hearing that term brought up in national and state level meetings now more than ever before. So Rahel, I think you're exactly right, uh, number one. Number two, Drew, I absolutely can feel your pain. Um, I think the role of state Medicaid programs right now is to one, recognize that there are limited and quite honestly to be sort of provocative, there are really zero measures that are specific to children with medical complexity that you're ready to put out there, right? That's, that's why we've been using in the academy, we're showing you the core sets. Now, kids with special health care needs, children with medical complexity, they absolutely deserve to get uh, immunizations and access measures and all, but, but we need to figure out what else is there. So, Rahel, what I like about the Texas experience is that, you, uh, and I remember that you made this point, um, I think it was on day one of the launch, and, and I'm, I'm hearing you say it again, you know, we're doing all of this work, but how do we capture the value? So the, the measures that are required, think about our tiering uh, uh, framework that we've shared with you in the SAG today, is okay, so what is it that you're doing? How many person hours does it take to get an integrated plan of care? Uh, and then what's the outcome on utilization and what's the outcome on experience? Um, and and I, my view of how we're going to think about measuring quality for children with medical complexity, and, and I want to mention that I don't just think that they're medically complex, there's a, a behavior, significant behavioral complexity and social complexity as well. Uh, you have basically th three domains. Domain one is overall experience of integration across the care team members. Two is utilization. The third bucket is measures that would be relevant to that particular subgroup. So if you've got patients uh, with uh, uh, epilepsy, you could be looking at quality measures that are specific to them. But I wanna be very, very clear. When we sit down with state Medicaid programs or sit at CMS, you're talking about measures that would be broadly relevant. I think that with 0.5 to 1.5% of the pediatric population to come up with measures that are going to be specific to that disease category that would be relevant across a state program is gonna be challenging. And so in sum, focus on experience of integration, focus on uh, utilization, capture the value so the Medicaid uh, programs can say, well, it took this many person hours for that team to reach out to the social worker component of the care team, to the education, to the early intervention program, et cetera. The space that we're in right now, all of us collectively, is actually to define what those value streams are. And that's what we want to do, um, uh, quite honestly. And I do think the ACE Kids legislation with this, this measures that CMS is going to be looking for is that opportunity for us. Thanks, Richard. We have another question that just came through the chat um, from Rhonda in Minnesota. She writes down, one of our challenges is that 50% of our complex care clinic population is Medicaid and then the rest are private pay. Should they be using the same measures with the private insurers to help sell their program for reimbursement? Um, hi, Rhonda. So I always think, so two things. One is to be clear about whether when you say, um, um, so private pay is not Medicaid managed care, just to make the distinction. But um, I think um, um, if you can get them all in the room to see that they all have the 
that the value is the same for all of them. I think that's an advantage. I also, you know, how do I say this? I think I've been in this position where I've had a lot of resistance in my life by somebody who didn't want to pay, you know, either the managed care organization in some cases, or somebody didn't inherently see the value of this level of care coordination. And I think this is something else we should talk about downstream, but I think it's all, always a question of how, who do you go to to prove that there's value in there if, um, you know, so the first thing is I would go to them and say, here's what we're doing. Here's our suite of measurement as Rich was talking about from experience of integration utilization and maybe some specific things. Here's our satisfaction, um, which was what um, Drew was talking about. And if that doesn't bite, then you can always go around, I mean, you can always go around the managed care organization and go to the employers as well. At one point we went to 3M in Minnesota to talk about the value of care coordination because we wanted them to understand it as well or the business action group or something like that. So I'm not sure if that's how, I guess I would always start by saying they should, we should get to the same measures um, um, as, um, across the whole system or else you go crazy. Does anybody want to speak at all to the last question in the last few minutes we have um, um, about how and where you're, you're presenting your case? Who are you talking to? Who's on? Who do you come with um, to talk about the value of what you're doing? Um, I, this is uh, Steve Carries in New Jersey. I can talk somewhat. Uh, we're one of the uh, projects uh, that have uh, ink um, monies behind us. So we're a little bit different in that uh, Medicaid is a partner with us. So we're not uh, trying to completely uh, sell what we're doing to, to state Medicaid, although I think in part we are. And the metrics that were, were developed for ink really come out of the Fed. So we have a whole set of metrics that we have to live up to, um, some of which make sense, some of which are pretty standard. There's a few measures that are, I think, very useful trying to get us to go from just healthcare to integrated care by looking at things like kindergarten readiness and so some of those sorts of uh, areas of, um, that I think are really, really important when you're talking about optimizing you know, outcomes for kids. It's not just their health outcomes, it's their overall outcomes. So I very much support that. But I think the, uh, the folks that we're trying to sell it to are going to be the um, at least in New Jersey, to manage care companies. So they're, they're the ones that actually run Medicaid in New Jersey. Um, Medicaid sets some of the standards, but they're relatively um, uh, not uh, particularly detailed enough to be useful. And we have to really sell it to the, um, to the clinicians too. I mean, we're, this works only if the clinicians that um, are gonna be transforming the way they provide care really buy into it, not just because getting paid some extra money, but because it actually um, makes sense and it um, makes both the lives of their families and their lives uh, better lives. So um, I think um, you know, some of our some of our metrics and some of the ways we're measuring have to have to reach out to that level too. You know, we're, we're kind of a little bit backward in some of the other states in that we um, already have Medicaid in our corner for this, and if we can show that we're doing a reasonably decent job, we can they're willing to make it statewide. So we, uh, we have their ear already. It's probably some of these other ears that we have to try to uh, connect to. So Steve, I have to ask, does Medicaid support you're going to the managed care organizations? Oh, very much so. Oh, oh yeah, actually, you know, it's in, in, as part of INC, you have this partnership council, as you know, of uh, various agencies and all the managed care companies are a part of it. You know, Medicaid is very much in favor of us uh, working with managed care, making it work. We um, have five managed Medicaid companies. They all have somewhat different agendas, but they've been very willing to sit down and talk to us about how it works and about redundancies and things of that sort. So, but I think the metrics that we come up, come up with have to really, um, you know, meet um, 
meet what they're looking for too. It's not just um, what, what state Medicaid is looking for. It, again, the feds have a whole set of metrics that they're looking for that um, we have them kind of dance around to some degree also. Um, but, um, but, but again, our, I think our audiences are maybe a little bit different than some of the other players uh, at the CCA. Steve, you're exactly right. And that's actually one of the reasons that when we uh, appealed to MCHB that we wanted to take advantage of the fact that the Inc. teams were specifically coming at this from the CMS or CMMI perspective. And so we really hope that some of the experience that, that you and North Carolina is another one of our participating uh, uh, Inc. Uh, teams, you know, what are some of the value stream metrics that you can do? What are the activities of care coordination that lead to measurable integration um, uh, across the system? Uh, people are struggling, uh, collective people are struggling now because this field needs to get the kinds of measure that we're developing. And so I, I do wanna make sure everybody in the academy knows this is why we've created the SAG, so we can learn from each other. Um, but I do think the opportunity for the Inc. folks to let us know about, you know, what your priorities are around measurement and what you need in terms of, of uh, interprofessional workforce development, uh, that, that is eventually going to inform this field. And we're, we're grateful that you've joined us. We have just a few more minutes. I see a question from Mary. Um, it says, are you engaging specific agencies beyond healthcare? Mary, is that directed towards Steve? I'm sorry, again, what, what was the question? I didn't quite hear it. Uh, if Mary's it was, I just tried to answer it for you, Steve. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Christine. Why don't you, uh, why don't you get into it? <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. Christine McCoy is Steve's, uh, Steve's colleague on the NJ Inc. project. So um, assuming that that in part was at least aimed at Steve, um, <laughs> in the Inc. projects, we have a very specific uh, set of core child um, services defined by CMMI. Um, that make up this partnership council that, that Steve was referring to. And so, um, you know, uh, they include early childhood, Title V, schools, um, uh, um, trying to think what else, uh, obviously behavioral health in, in many forms, including mobile crisis response, um, and uh, housing, food. Um, and then they recommend that we also work with legal services, law enforcement, juvenile justice, um, as well, although those are not required. Thank you. This I sounds like we need to. Yeah, I just want to say it'd be really. I'm keep. I'm taking notes, but it's really interesting when we get to a discussion about social determinants and the risk factors that those pose. It'd be really interesting to talk to you guys in New Jersey. I wanted to ask. I, I have to ask one more question in New Jersey because I'm just really curious. Um, Steve, does the does Medicaid put any pressure on the MCOs to help you, or do they just say go go off and talk to each other, you yeah, know, in yeah, terms of yeah, like contract yeah. requirements, et cetera? I wish they would, but no, they've been they're fairly laissez faire. I mean, they they have a set um, you know standards that the Medicare companies have to look up to, but they're but they're just not particularly detailed enough or useful enough, as I as I as I mentioned. They they give the Medicare companies a lot of latitude. To do it their way so they're not nearly as prescriptive i think as for example maybe you were in minnesota with uh, with state medicaid yeah so let's do this we're coming up on the end of this time in fact we got a minute so i got to say the following things first thank you for coming and uh and second remind you that this is a community where we really all want to learn from each other um we'll send out some sort of evaluation of this so people can actually um um, see how this can, how this was helpful, how it can be helpful in the future. And I think what I'm sure Rich and I and Heather will talk about is, do we riff off of this discussion to go to the next one, or do we pick another topic that you um, talked about before? Um, the more you participate, the more it'll be helpful. Um, and um, I think this is really cool because I think just the idea that we can talk about each other and how we're doing in each other's states will be really helpful next time. If anybody wants to volunteer to be the first state out of the block um, and talk about where you're at, um, we would welcome that um, volunteership. Um, Dr. Antonelli, anything you would like to say? Uh, just 
uh, again, gratitude. Uh, Heather, you and Erica Norkis, our coordinator, did a great job. Uh, Jeff, thank you for the work. I really feel that we've identified several really important questions that we can all rally around. Uh, we'll be uh, doing some outreach as well as uh, waiting to hear from you. We, we hope you appreciate the fact that these, the SAG is really designed for shared problem solving. There's lots of work to do. If anybody joined the, either the Academy or the SAG thinking that we've got magic beans and all you have to do is plant one and poof, it's all gonna get done. You know, that isn't gonna happen. I think Drew, I really particularly appreciated your comments with how diligently the Medicaid program was looking. I think the ink states are gonna be able to help inform some of this work. I think Mary, the work you've done in Indiana with what seems to be sort of shifting budgetary uh, abilities, but we owe it to the children and the families. I'll sort of close it with that. We owe it to them to keep moving this forward. HEDIS is not enough for CMC and then for that, are most children and youth with special health care needs. So let's work together to define some measures uh, that we can begin testing now. And thank you, everybody. We'll see you on thank November. You. Heather, when's, Heather, when's the next tag? The next one is the third Monday of November. Now it is coming up. It should be in everyone's inbox, but it is already all set and scheduled. It is November 16th at three o'clock Eastern time. Be well, everybody. Go vote. Have a safe fall. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.